many of you know, I'm Mark Kiesling, and I run the Prevention Pursuit, but my other um, full-time volunteer job is I'm the um, co-chair of Row, Reconnecting Row Waterway, um, which really looks at six waterways um, from lenses that are exciting to create a way of getting Indianapolis uh, to prove general quality of life. Um, and one of those ways is through aesthetics. Um, and so we had um, a grant that really actually helped in the neighborhoods that we're looking at through the Presky Foundation that looked at how you create creative placemaking um, or placemaking within um, neighborhoods along all six of our waterways. So we have five rivers and one uh, man-made waterway that form the six. And that actually covers about 82% of the county of Marion County. So within a, about a five minute walk within each waterway, you would encompass almost all the residents of the entire city. Um, and so it's unique for Indianapolis in that we waterways and water are ubiquitous here. Um, lots of other major cities all have one or two rivers at the most, but we have uh, five rivers. Um, so that that was one of the challenges when Indianapolis was founded, but also one of um, exciting things now when we think about it. So what we had done uh, historically was turn those rivers into our um, sewage system. Um, and we're fixing some of that. Um, but because of that, people turned away from it. They didn't want to be close to them. They didn't want to go smelly. They were dirty. Uh, there were just lots of issues along there. Um, so what happens is, is that as we do this and we look at neighborhoods, we look at creative ways to get people to re-engage um, with that water along there. How do we engage the neighbors? So first person, I'd love to introduce yourself. Uh, from Mapleton Falk Creek. Good morning. Good morning. Mm -hmm. My name is Lee, Lee Riley Evans. I am a lifelong resident of Indianapolis, born and raised here, and for the majority of my life have lived in the Mapleton Falk Creek neighborhood, which is one of six Mid North neighborhoods that is implementing a quality of life plan. We started working for an organization called Mapleton Falk Creek Development Corporation full-time as an executive director in January of 2012, but moved back into that neighborhood to be close to my parents um, in 2008. My husband and our three boys decided that we were um, ready to make sure that they could walk to Grandma's house and have that extended support service. And so since that time, have been really working to address the processes as well as the philosophy of the Mapleton Fall Creek area, which is um, identified by landmarks, as you'll see here in the picture, of the world's largest children's museum, kind of in the heart of our neighborhood. There is the flagship community college, Ivy Tech, which is in the southern portion near Fall Creek. And then up to the north, you'll find the state fairgrounds at one end, IMA or Crown Hill on another area. But the six neighborhoods specifically that we serve based on our strategic plan of addressing both people and places, or rooftops and retail, depending on how you want to address it, our Crown Hill, Island vicinity, Meridian Highland, Historic Meridian Park, Historic Watson Park, and then Mapleton Fall Creek. And so this area is identified because it is in the heart of the city. That location, you want to turn the light off? Yeah. So it'll be a little easier to see. Yeah. <laughs> that location is. <laughs> it's about a 15 minute commute to everything. I mean, all of Indianapolis is the major employment center, major universities, the arts and cultural pieces. And so in all real estate markets, you talk about location, location, location. And one of those assets in that location is the Fall Creek Waterway that, that Mark mentioned. And so all um, residents were surveyed in the early, in this um, several years ago by my board. And the community preference was to live in a space that didn't have a long commute, that was a walkable location, and the houses were built closer together to actually support having access to both the waterways as well as businesses and your neighbors. And so our location has experienced a tremendous amount of urban renewal, uh, which is very much a trend that many other urban environments are experiencing. We are stimulating growth, 
and directly in response to that 15 minute commute, millennials as well as baby boomers and everything in between, all those people in between, have started to choose one of these six neighborhoods, specifically Mapleton Fall Creek, to call their home. And we have been responsible for stimulating that growth in this urban core using creative placemaking, which is a cross-section of partners dealing with planning, designing, and the implementation around public spaces. And so we have been investing residential um, support to attract people to a neighborhood that had experienced decades of disinvestment, decades of loss of population as both the manufacturing as well as the residents left. So Center Township in the late 60s had a population of over 300,000 individuals. By the mid-60s, that had dropped to about 140,000 residents. And so decade after decade, up until 2012, the data is showing that that population has continued to decline. And the Mapleton Fall Creek Development Corporation, in support with the city of Indianapolis, organizations like LISC, reconnected to our waterways, and others, started creating a strategy around the waterway making sure that we were creatively identifying the public spaces in our area. And that initiative was called Destination Fall Creek. It, it specifically addressed the aesthetics while we were also working on the housing, working on the business development, working on youth engagement and advocating for our seniors. And this is just one of the examples of the residential investment that was making it possible for those, in, those individuals interested in living back in the neighborhood to have a home to live in and then have a business to walk to or a trail to walk along the waterway. And so starting from 2009, when we had a catalyst grant of three and a half million from the city of Indianapolis to stabilize the neighborhood that was specifically called the Neighborhood Stabilization Program, followed then with support from the local initial support corporation through our quality of life plan, we have since leveraged support to address the people and the places, again, those rooftops and retail, to a tune of nearly $43 million because of the waterway that we have in the middle of our geography. And so we have specifically made homes available that used to look like the picture on the left, now look like the picture on the right for families um, to the tune of at least 56 families by the end of 2014. And in addition to the residential investment, again, it has been centralized around our waterway. And so that means the roads, the bridges, the trails, and in the long-term support for our combined sewer overflow, there has been additional investment to the Fall Creek waterway. This is the trail that was initially extended to create a four-mile stretch of trail that, that didn't initially exist in one of these mid-north neighborhoods. So now, you can travel from Fort Benjamin Harrison all the way downtown Indianapolis and only have to stop four times. And that happened because of the four mile extension in this area as a result of our initiative called Destination Fall Creek. We are celebrating the abilities to recapture the history of the historical bridges that George Keschler originally designed <coughs> for the Fall Creek Waterway, so both the Illinois Street Bridge, the Meridian Street Bridge, and you will start to soon see activity on Central Avenue for additional repair. And so this is just one of the four focus areas that I want to highlight. Uh, there was a long, multi-year planning process with residents of the Midbrook area and to identify four specific focus areas along the waterway. And we call it, again, Destination Fall Creek. And this specific location is at the intersection of Fall Creek Parkway and Delaware Street. And so you often may interact with it as you're traveling north out of downtown along Delaware. You will come to this space that is very confusing. There are at least seven or nine options in terms of how you can turn or how you can interact. There are nearly 32,000 vehicles that travel through this space on a daily basis. It is one of the most difficult, if not impossible, crossing intersections for pedestrians as well as bicyclists in the city of Indianapolis, and it was one of our four focus areas, and was a great opportunity for us to demonstrate that strategic cross-section of partners to make it possible to create a public space creatively in our neighborhood. And so, starting on the west side, which is Talbot, and then toward the east side, which takes you closer to New Jersey or Central Avenue, that biggest point right here is that intersection of Fall Creek and 
and Falk at Delaware. And so at this intersection, you will often see a sign that says, do not enter, not welcome, wrong way. It is definitely the wrong message that we are trying to have people interact with our neighborhood as they first enter. And so we now have plans uh, because of nearly three, $365,000 that was allocated with the support of the city to build, rebuild Indianapolis to establish crosswalks as well as new traffic patterns and a new gateway monument. And so in partnership with several individuals in the artist community as well as residents, we have identified a local artist and selected the piece that you see in the bottom called Silver Fall. It is a um, an artwork designed by Scott Westfall that we anticipate having installed at this intersection at, at, during the fall of 2016. But it has been over, gosh, two and a half years worth of work and effort to have this space recognized for its, um, its prominence in the community. And so it addresses connectivity, it improves the access, and then it installs public art so that people can again start to interact with this public space. We will eliminate a couple of the lanes of traffic. Currently there is a road that you can travel to get to Roger Boulevard, as well as a road to get to Talbot. Those will be eliminated so that we can reduce the traffic, we will change the traffic patterns. If you want to continue traveling north, you will be able to do that, traveling on a two-way intersection now straight through Delaware, and then turn left or right on 28th Street. But it will allow bicyclists, pedestrians, uh, cars, people in wheelchairs, people moving through with walkers to all interact with this space more safely. And it, it, it embodies a complete streets approach to how we want to interact with Fall Creek Parkway. And again, it is a cross section of partners, the city of Indianapolis, Department of Public Works specifically, Citizens Energy Group, because of their combined sewer overflow, is digging up a portion of the road and will return it to a bike boulevard as the residents have designed as we move forward. So that's just one example of how we are using creative place making to actually celebrate our <coughs> efforts along the waterway. And this is an example of one of our fall festivals. We have curated three of these and doing a, um, excuse me, doing a Echo revelatory art project in the park. As you interact with that space now, you will see that there are tremendous trees that have suffered the invasion of the Echo Ash Borer. And so, this is our way to educate the community about not always putting one species of tree in an area and then also what damage the Echo Ash Borer does to the trees. We're working to have those trees removed and new trees planted. This is an education opportunity with reconnecting our waterways, just showing how we can um, create partners along the creative efforts to plan that, that design. And so this is just a quick overview of some of the other work that we do as a development corporation. It is a very comprehensive community development effort. Uh, housing is the backbone of the work that we do, but we are more than just the bricks and sticks. However, we are able to make more than a million dollars of affordable housing impact to the area. We address the economic development work. Again, the parks and public spaces with a lot of what we do and involving raising voices for our community to have the bridges, the trails, and the streets redone, all with the focus on sustainability. We want to continue to be leaders in energy and environmental designs we know in this neighborhood. And creative place is just one of those tools that we use to create a better quality of life for residents in our neighborhood. And so as we continue to connect neighborhood partners to our communities through our houses, highlighting our environment and supporting the business, we want to be that hub of activity for all those things, using creative placement as that tool. So thank you. And if there are any questions, you can ask those now, and then we'll also get additional questions towards the end of the session. Um, when you chose the artist, I mean, how did the distribution fall creek uh, come before the quality of life plan or after this one, and then is there a common theme? I love what you did. I have. I love what you did. Well, is there a common theme throughout the Destination Fall Creek? Okay, first question. Destination Fall Creek came as part of the Quality of Life Plan. Okay. Specific to the aesthetic section of that plan, there was an action item. I can't remember off the top of my head what the code is, like 2.3.4 mm -hmm. or something. Okay. 
but it spoke to specifically establishing a trail system and raising the awareness of the waterway. So transforming it to a residential, recreational space for all citizens. Okay. Um, so that was one piece. And so that initiative grew to what you see now being implemented on a regular basis. And then we did an, addi an additional community building and planning effort I, through that um, preference surveys and, and conversations and community meetings is how we identified four specific areas that were at that crossroad between college, um, challenge and opportunity and seemed to be the most impactful to address transforming the Fall Creek waterway. Okay. And so that's how Destination Fall Creek happened. And it was concurrent, honestly, to the Reconnected to Our Waterways initiative that the city was implementing. And we tried to be that model waterway um, and continue to advance the conversations of innovation. And then your second question, just in terms of the theme, it's about access. It's um, access to the water. To the water. Okay. Um, and just making sure that we are working in partnership and through a collaborative effort with all of our um, stakeholders. And so continuing to be a voice for the residents that have been there, the ones that we're trying to keep there, the ones that we're also trying to attract as and then making a safe space for our visitors and our residents. So the theme has consistently been access and improving the connectivity to the water. I think Fall Creek has particular challenges in that um, two of the major things that created a lack of access is that the river is right next to what became almost a highway. Mm -hmm. And so, right. while well, Kessler's plan for that, and if you look at the original stuff for there, there was actually a boulevard. Right. And there were green trees and a green down the middle, and there were lanes, only two lanes on the inside for cars and walking and all that. And then somewhere along the way, like we did much of the city, we wanted to make access out fast mm -hmm. and in fast. Mm -hmm. well, we we turned that in. We took out all that boulevard. Work. So what happens is the, the waterway, nature, and all that stuff is completely isolated mm -hmm. on the other side of that. Okay. And so it, it, for Fall, Fall Creek, it is accessibility because it, it, it created a, a disconnect between that beauty. Right. We became very auto centric. That's really what mm -hmm. happened. So as Harry Stutz and Lucifer and Harry Poor were trying to make a living and, and encouraging all of us to drive an automobile and providing an opportunity for us to get to farther stretches, that's what happened. So those rows of maple trees eventually were eliminated mm -hmm. as more lanes were created for the automobile and farther for us to get from the house mm -hmm. to the water. And so working on improving that access, there will be a and one of our other uh, focus area there is now a bridge, a pedestrian bridge, so along the Monon to get across 38th Street. Right. Uh -huh. there, there will be a bridge there. We're working on just signalizing the crosswalks and the intersections so that people can feel more comfortable not having to play a game of Frogger to get across the street. Uh -huh. And then installing public art to actually attract people to the waterway and to get on the trail mm -hmm. and to use the bridges for us. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Lee. All right, thank you. Um, next speaker is Alan. Does anyone understand? Yeah, that's just. Let me Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Alan. Uh, I know some of you. Uh, it's good to see you guys. Um, I, uh, this, I'm brand new to Neighbor Power, so I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, who I am, my history, and, uh, and how I got to where I am now, and uh, creative placemaking, what that looks like, what that means maybe a little bit, and um, um, what that could look like on the ball. In Indianapolis. Um, so I, um, Alan Gufrinsky, that's me right there in that boat. Um, I uh, uh, am Big Cars Creative Placemaker for Reconnecting to Our Waterways, and, and Mark will be read a little bit about Will uh, a second ago if you didn't already know what Will was. Um, uh, my uh, history in art uh, comes from a very organic place. Um, I 
and, and, uh, and our school dropouts um, who found um, a creative community when I moved here to Indianapolis. And uh, um, it, uh, it changed my life dramatically um, in the sense that I felt like I felt welcome in, in art. I felt like I had a place in art and I felt like um, art and community were interchangeable words almost to me. They kind of, there was this kind of seamlessness to, to when, when I talked about creating art, I was inherently talking about creating community. Um, the, this community that I'm talking about is a group of friends uh, called No No Stranger. Um, if you're not familiar with them, there's, uh, they're doing this amazing thing at the IMA for the seventh time. Uh, the seventh, their seventh annual optical popsicle is uh, tonight, actually. So it's it's amazing. We should we should look into it. But um, uh, no, no stranger was essentially just a group of people who were sick and tired of um, the way a group of artists who were sick and tired of the way that we were viewing our communities, it, uh, our community of Indianapolis, in a very sort of downtrodden way. That like when we moved. Uh, when I moved to this city about eight years ago, um, I, I, it just made me my perspective, like coming into the city and learning more things. But I think that it's safe to say our city's come a long way over the, like the past the past decade in the in civic pride and the way that we engage um, and value our communities and the way we value the arts um, uh, and. So right about that, the time that um, I moved to the city and I started meeting these friends, we started to kind of get fed up with the, some of the negativity we were hearing about our community. Um, and it kind of dawned on us that like, maybe instead of like whining about it, if, if everyone, instead of just whining about it, like actually did something, like we could, we could like have a, a nice city, like go figure, you know, like there's, <laughs> There's a lot of energy that's wasted uh, and potential that's wasted in, in, in negativity and bad attitudes. So we, we decided we, wanted, we just wanted to do something that we, that we wanted to put on the kind of show and the kind of activity that we, um, that we wanted to see in the city. You know, we wanted to kind of, you know, kind of, kind of go, kind of move forward and do that. So we put on the first annual optical possible. It was a, uh, an huge accidental hit. Um, it involved a huge pep talk of you know, get out there and do your do do what makes um, you excited about your community and like, and like let's bring our communities to life. Um, from there, we accidentally um, got uh, some. It's, it was all very accidental. It was all very organic. We got some notoriety. We got some people. Um, who wanted to support us in what we were doing, who saw what we were doing as valuable. So they hired us to do other things. And they, um, think things like um, Spirit and Place Festival, um, the, humani the humanities, uh, they asked us to be part of this this thing called, this, uh, this Spirit and Place Festival, which was totally new to us. They asked us to, um, help devise some sort of um, activity in the spirit of play. Um, this was kind of one of uh, No No Stranger's first, I don't know, ventures out into what you could maybe consider creative place making or um, um, community engaging art or you know, like active, active, active like art in the communities. Um, we made, well, I think it was close to a hundred of these, um, they're, they're vinyl on, on some sort of really adhesive aluminum that would adhere to like any surface that you s stick it on for, like, like, it's like super, like, s super permanent, temporary, um, like almost vandalism thing, but hey, it, they, they told us to do it, so we did it. Uh, we came up with all these really unique games that were very place-based. So this was one of my favorite ones. Like um, the game was, you put your hand, you put your hand on there, and 
you're not allowed to take it off until someone else put your, puts their hand on there, and you, you can't, you're not allowed to move your hand until you no longer uh, feel like you're strangers. Um, there's, so they, were, they were placed all over town, the Central Canal, they were placed outside of buildings. There were games where um, all you had to do was sit down next to someone and watch people walking in and out of revolving doors. And um, if, if, you, uh, if you had more people walking in your revolving door than your opponent on this side, then you won that game. Or uh, it involved tossing a, a penny up a fountain that looked like a waterfall almost like a bozo bucket style thing. They were all about engaging place that was places that were already there and um, uh, not adding new infrastructure, not adding new anything to the surroundings, but just encouraging people to look at their surroundings in a new way and in a playful way. Because when you alter someone's um, inner, when you, when you create a new interaction for a person in a location, um, you forever change the way that they see the place, and you forever change uh, their experience moving forward with the place. You'll forever change the way they talk about their, uh, their the, the place that maybe they walk by every day of their life and never, um, never even. Uh, when it's just become so routine that they don't even notice the opportunities uh, for beauty and uh, and fun and joy around them. Another one uh, on Mass Ave. I'm sure that's a, a, a structure you're familiar with over there. I wish I remembered what that game was. Um, maybe it was a dance competition. I don't know. That sounds about right. That was a problem. <laughs> uh, Oh, that slide's, that slide's vanished. Looks like that slide's vanished. I remember what it was though. It was, um, oh yeah, it was a picture of me in a funny costume. Uh, so, um, uh, another, another aspect, another interesting thing that I, I want to, the last of the, the Remember Stranger era things that I want to highlight is, um, a, um, a thing that we called the hunt. Um, and this was kind of based on the idea that uh, another another notion that Indy, Indy has a lot of like really amazing things all around that people don't don't um, really value to their fullest potential. Um, so we put on this citywide 24-hour scavenger hunt that uh, had some crazy awesome prizes and stuff. And, um, it was all about you know getting people out to things in the, our community that were valuable because it's hard to um, create create a, a place. It's hard to like creatively um, engage a place when people don't even know that places exist and that there are valuable things in the community to value. And that I feel like there's a really strong statement that can be said about a lot of our waterways in Indianapolis. Um, they, for, for decades, um, we've turned away from our waterways ever since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, Lee was talking about that a little bit, about just the, the auto, like automobiles and everything like that, and, and malaria, and just the, all the things that turn, have turned our, like, our waterways into these cesspools post-Industrial Revolution. Um, uh, we are, are now, we're, we're recovering from that. In, in, in a lot of ways, um, but some of the infrastructure damage has already been done. Where you know things like like Fall Creek uh, Road have kind of just you know, they kind of we've got it like like Mark said we've got a highway coming out of town now that um, um, you, you can drive the entire length of it and not even see the waterway right to the side of it. Um, so one of, like one of the most important things. In, and creative place making is creative is is place finding and place seeing and place directing, bringing people to these locations, um, which is a really unique challenge for our waterways in the city. Trying to get people to notice that they're even there, we drive over them day after day, and there are invasive species.
that are covering them in a lot of places. And there are, you know, the, the bridge just kind of comes out of nowhere. You're over the bridge, and if you didn't take that split second to look to your left or right, you didn't see that water and it just drove over. Um, Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, about uh, this is at Victor at Oxford Kinetic Fest that actually made these pigeon heads um, because uh, really strange things, really odd things, uh, make people curious. And and uh, if you can do something, if you can put yourself out there and uh, make something curious happen, make people drawn in to what you're doing, then uh, then you uh, then you have got you've got an audience that you can engage with whatever whatever you're looking for. Um, that brings me to uh, Big Car's waterway mascot, the big car. Uh, get it? Big car, big car. Uh, car is uh, is is, uh, is a, a fish that's very prominent in the White River. It's a uh, it's very uh, sought after fish by a lot of the fishermen in, in communities in, in the city because they grow really big and they're really fun to catch. So we made a really big, really fun mascot uh, for the waterways. That, that's, that's me and that bad boy right there. <laughs> this is actually taking place at, um, at Dig Inn on the White River. Uh, it was a uh, very oh, Show you. That's, that's also you can see a big a big foot made out of thrift store wigs <laughs> right to the right there. Um, people like big foot quite a bit too. Uh, uh, so this is taking place at Big Bang. Um, uh, we use the the mascot similar to like the pigeons, and then in a way to just kind of bring people together. You, kids. Kids run up to anything in a big suit. They run as fast as they can. I mean, sometimes you get a, sometimes you get a little a little kid who's terrified, but uh, you know then their parents usually and, you know, and whenever wherever kids go, parents go too. Their parents are right behind them. So it's uh, a really great way to draw people into what you're trying to do. Uh, if you can step out of your comfort zone as an adult, it encourages other people to step out of their comfort zones and get a little crazy. Um, uh, this uh, uh, this is a picture. This is a picture of a guy taking a picture. I guess uh, uh, I wanted to I wanted to emphasize essentially that um, use whatever you can if you if you're trying to if you're trying to bring creativity and art to the waterways or to any location really um, do whatever you can to get the word out. Create hype. Get, um, get bloggers, get people. Like I said, the waterways are a unique challenge where sometimes they're, they're really hard to, you can't always rely on traffic that's already existing walking through a location to, to pick up on what you're doing and, and, uh, and engage. Creative place making on the waterways a lot of times is going to involve bringing people to the waterways um, and encouraging them to interact in a new way. Um, last thing I want to talk about is one of the last things I want to talk about is the Wagon of Wonders. The Wagon of Wonders is something that Big Car built um, uh, with by utilizing a bunch of different artists you know, to come together on this project. And this uh, project was intended to be like an instant place wherever you put it. Uh, it's supposed to it's supposed to serve as this um, this thing that will draw people in. Uh, there's uh, art installation all around this this gigantic um, uh, wagon, this gigantic trailer uh, that involves you know creative games that you can play. You can see them being participated uh, with there. There's a museum quality art gallery in the black in the back that was that big uh, big foot creature costume there, um, and on one side of it it. Also, uh, one entire side is devoted to a mobile bait and tackle shop. Uh, now, this bait and tackle shop 
is kind of, it's, it's functional. We've got bait and tackle for sale in this bait and tackle shop. We loan poles to children uh, who want to use them at the waterways, when we set up by the waterways. If we're not set up by the waterways, we get to do programming out of it to kind of talk about the waterways and, and educate people on their existence. Um, it was modeled after the West Side Bait and Tackle Shop, which is a, a community entity. They've been there for like 60 years or something like that. Family owned and operated. Really uh, uh, an amazing uh, feature in the community uh, where a lot of community, uh, there's like a lot of gathering that happens really naturally out there. So we wanted to pay homage to that. And uh, they've been really supportive in what we were doing as well. Kind of seeing a broader picture of the bait down the shop up there. Um, the roof of this thing was built to extend the weight of, of, of a band playing on top of it. So you can take this thing out to the waterways. Um, and people who might not know that they like an art, they would like an art experience, might be more drawn to their bait and tackle shop than something to art. Or if we take it somewhere and people are really into art, they might not know that they would like a waterways experience. They come out on the other side and suck them into the waterways. So it's, it's, uh, it's strategic in that sense. Um, I'm going to try and move a little quickly here. I want to make sure that we have time for questions. Um, these are some activities um, that were designed to sort of educate about the waterways in a fun way. Um, I like to make things that make sense for kids. I like to do things that make sense for kids because um, if I get if I get the kids, I'm going to get the adults to show up too. They're going to learn as well. Um, uh, yeah, getting people to step out of their comfort zones and, uh, and, uh, and engage their uh, their space in, in a new way. Like I said, it's gonna it's gonna change how they look at space moving forward. Um, another thing is uh, don't um, underestimate adults. Um, adults like to have fun too. Like adults are willing to get to to act like kids if you um, if you're willing to make a fool out of yourself a little bit. And, encourage them to, to, to get on your level. Um, <laughs> here's a prime example of an adult acting like a kid right here. So this is uh, 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 the last little thing I want to talk to you guys about, the last little experiment that we did a while back. Um, we call this uh, a, uh, a uh, impromptu finish line. We set up at the canal. Uh, right at right after work hours, when um, when everyone uh, was you know was changing in, changing into their workout clothes to go for their evening job on a, on a beautiful summer evening, we just set up these we set up with all these signs, uh, finish line, a, a ribbon to go across the trail. Someone was handing out cups of water. Everyone was cheering. I had the tiger was pumping loud on the stereo speakers and. And everyone, no one had any idea this was happening. No one, there was no race happening. I, people were utterly confused in the best way when they came upon this. They were, they were, some of them were like, everyone was smiling. Some of them were like, I'm not even in the race. No one's in the race. Keep going. You're <laughs> jailing. Um, and uh, yeah, so people from, people, you know, and of course this isn't about shoving art down anyone's throat by any means. There were people that didn't want to participate in it. They went around, and we let them go around. That's okay, you know. Either way, they still went home that day, and they're like, "You had, you got it. You, you know, they're talking to their wife or husband or, you know, whatever their kids. Like, you would not imagine what I saw. Uh, you know, it, it's just totally transforming the way people are seeing this space. Maybe they went home and they thought, "Why aren't fun art things like this happening all the time on the canal?" Or like, or I never thought of this as a destination for a race. Why aren't we doing this kind of thing here all the time? Or why, why don't we? Why don't? Why doesn't someone put on a race here? Maybe I'm gonna. Maybe I'm gonna start a fall, or start a, a you know, a canal run or something like that. Maybe I can get a group of people out who are gonna be interested in doing this kind of thing. Um, and uh, this is one of our. This is one. Of, this is just. A, this is just someone who was running down the street, running down the trail. He, he was absolutely. You can see the smile on his face. He's cheesing so hard. We put. We put him on a on a, on a podium with a trophy, 
he still, at this point, he still has no idea why he's standing there, why this is happening. <laughs> I, I, I added him a flyer afterwards explaining what everything, what everything was. He was just, he was just super excited to be part of it. He knew that something whimsical was happening. He, he knew that he wasn't ready to run in a race and that we were excited for him anyways. And, you know, we gave him a pat on his sweaty back and told him to keep being awesome and keep, you know, utilizing, like, our shared public space in such a, uh, you know, an awesome way. It, uh, and this is another example of, you know, if you're willing to step out of your comfort zone and act like an idiot, uh, it, it's going to be, like, the, the, the best thing that you can do to encourage other people to also um, feel like they are welcome and comfortable doing the same thing. <laughs> there was a picture of me uh, in, a, uh, in a really awesome Frankenstein costume here. Thanks, Don. Any questions? Uh, Big Car, can you give us an overview of Big Car? Is it, I remember hearing about Big Car on Lafayette Road a long time ago. Sure. It seems like it's, it's morphed into something really explosive and different components. Um, can you give me a, give us an overview of what Big Car is about? Yeah, I can do my best. Um, I'm fairly new to Big Car, but I have uh, I have been involved with Big Car in, in some way, shape, or form for a long time. Um, Big Car started out pretty organically, from what I understand, uh, as a, a group of artists, who, you know, Together and uh, I, Jim is good at writing grants, so he, he gets a lot of funding for some uh, really, uh, really excellent things. Um, but Big Car, um, um, Big Car is all all about bringing people to art and art to people, uh, and for the for the you know, for the good of our communities. Um, so anything that falls within that realm is something that. Uh, that excites, excites us. Um, uh, currently, Big Car is, uh, is moving into a new facility down in Garfield Park, which you may have heard a lot about. Um, it's got a lot of video coverage. Um, and that's going to be kind of Big Car's permanent home moving forward. Uh, where so, something where something, uh, I mean, the goal uh, of the Lafayette area was to. Um, Occupy that space until uh, market forces required that you know because you know, we were we were the, uh, their temper the car was right. their temper. Mm -hmm. So one of so one of you know one of the challenges um, that we face along waterways sometimes is what we initially think mm -hmm. is going to work or be a part of that doesn't always there are certain forces that drive it. And one of the challenges of all of us face not just picture art but all of us working. The tension between neighborhood and um, business concerns. And so, what happened is, there's a lot of that area, the business concerns were not aligned with what the neighborhood and residents were doing. And so, um, it, we are now refocusing uh, all of us on actually working with neighborhood residents rather than working on directly with the business community. That doesn't mean that there isn't a role for them but we had to shift our focus. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes back to what's really powerful in every one of these, and this is what we've said. It goes back to the power of that um, whole effort to look at quality of life planning. Mm -hmm. If that plan doesn't exist, it is really hard to do placemaking and placemaking uh, in an area because a lot of priorities. Where is that plan driven from? Say that again. Where's the plan driven from? The, so you talk about quality of life, quality of life, and that that needs to be in place. But where is the energy? Well, from the people. Um, our quality of life planning session started with nearly 500 residents deciding we're going to work together to live life better in our space. And so it came from their their understanding that as long as we continue to do things the same way, we would have what we have, and our desire to have something different. And so partnering with 
organizations like the Global Initial Support Corporation, the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, and those area businesses. It really was a cross-section. But the, the, the motive came from the residents. Well, that's, I mean, it's great that, it, that, that, that happened. But you, know, so you talk about the partners, you talk about the people, but somewhere there had to be some sort of organizing structure that said, we're going to talk to the people, we're going to put the well, set, together. Yeah, there's a couple of organizations that really helped do it. LISC is one of them, so Local Initiative Support Corporation. Mm -hmm. The other one's CICF, who also puts community organizers into areas where they begin to develop a quality of life. And then, so there are other, and then there are corporate partners that come. But it has to come. It's interesting. Um, the Near West just completed a quality of life, which is the, probably the newest quality of life plan we have on the docket. Um, but it took a long time before the residents could organize. So even though you might have an outside set of groups that push at it, that the goal here is, is it's got to be the residents feeling that that's time to come together, that the moment is right. Because that did happen in our area right. um, during what was called the Jenny Initiative, local initiative support corporations that tried, and there, it was, this was the second, almost third iteration before those residents finally said, okay, we've got to figure out our internal structure and come together. Yet the supports are there, but... I mean, to me, it always right. seems like there's this tension you need that community in here. But you also need that people live, live very busy lives. Correct. So you almost have to provide enough structure for them to just kind of walk into that. You, know, you do. do yeah. that. And that's also one of the roles that the development corporation plays, is because we end up being that lead implementing partner. Um, the residents start have the conversations, the, the funders and the backbone support of the museum or the list is there as well. Mm -hmm. But then we help propel that collective impact through the community development corporation. Well, and then you talk about partners mm -hmm. need to be in place as well because there's clearly, I mean, in your case, especially the huge infrastructure problem. Yes. So you need to get them first engaged in the conversation and then aligned on what the, the desired impact is. There are lots of parts and pieces. They're all it is. It's all that moving pieces. So what's so great, and Alan can probably talk to this, what's great about the initiatives that creative placemaking or creative placemakers do is sometimes they can go ahead of that community to be able to pull the community together. So you might want to speak about how, what you do, like when you did the thing on the canal, or you just popped up the finish line, how that might lead to people deciding they do want to be working. Yeah, so sometimes um, sometimes uh, a lot of city planning and uh, a lot of you know, you know, dollars spent on um, on, uh, on, on longitudinal studies and things like that, sometimes those, sometimes they are the answer, sometimes they aren't. Sometimes you can get a lot more information just by doing something in a very temporary way um, and, uh, and and, and then looking at data from the results of that, um, you know, maybe you know something like, I mean something like the the, the finish line is a, is a very silly thing, but if you if you uh, were to look at uh, if you if you were to do something like that and realize that everyone hated it, no one liked it, like you that could that would inform like what you want to do before. If maybe you set up there and no one was using the trail at all. You know, at it and like, there's just no no one there to engage no one there to engage that uh, you learn a little bit more about the culture of the water bank without without um, doing the study or something. Yes, yeah, so so part of what you're saying now is that when you do these things, even as wonderful as they are, sometimes they create a happening. They create that there may be there's something going on. Um, and that something going on starts to make neighborhoods and places feel. I think Big Car's efforts, uh, I've talked to too, but Big Car's efforts with, um, when they were in the Lafayette Square region, made something going on there. Well, you do two things. I mean, one is you create that, and you just have that down in point of mind. But the other is, I, I think you may be a little dismissive about the, the, the evaluative value of these principal things. I think that you know, say it's not a study. It's, it's simply a different kind of study. Right, right. 
Yeah, and then if you know if the study finds out, you know, if this this different kind of study, at the end of it, you learn like, like oh, this isn't going to work. This is a bad idea. At least you had that experience. And you had that experience. You've and done it in a relatively low cost way. Got the community engaged, even if it's engaged to say, yeah, we don't want this. Right. 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 I want to be good with everybody's time. I can do one more. Another question. Is the car? Do you do you make appearances? <laughs> yeah, it's a good, uh, I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you my card. Okay. Oh, that's a great way. I, I saw. I saw the car. I was running on the Monon, and I saw you down at the, the boat dock area by the art center. You were running. You were running. Okay, that was during. Yes. Uh, that was during Kevin McKelvey's uh, uh, White River Festival. Yeah. So when I saw you in the car in a group of people, I was just like, laugh. That is I knew it was you. <laughs> so, uh, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.